This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, the Bowtie Bandit of Blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with Dr. Chris Hartley, Assistant Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic on the topic of cytopathology. So thanks for joining us today, Dr. Hartley. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to be here talking to you this morning. So Chris, uh, you guys in cytopathology are dealing with little things, and I was wondering if you could explain for our audience really kind of what is cytopathology and, and why is it an important area of, of medical practice? Yeah, so it is, it is really just looking at little things. It's looking at cells, um, and really we only use two stains. Um, there have been an increasing number of ancillary things done, but ultimately it's, it's really just using your eyes to look at cells um, with stains that have been around for a hundred years now. Um, you know, and those cells may be obtained uh, from a fluid. Um, the, probably the most well-known is the, is the pap smear, which is, uh, you know, the most successful uh, cancer screening program in, in, in history. Um, so it's, it's great to be a part of that on, on a daily basis. Um, but the cells may, so that, that's when the, those are cells are scraped away. Um, you can scrape cells away from a, a variety of places in the body, biliary tract. Um, you can brush the bronchioles in the lungs. Um, and then, of course, there's FNA where you find needle aspiration, where you uh, introduce a needle that's a, it's a smaller gauge than um, you would use for even a blood draw. And uh, you just aspirate cells uh, into a syringe and put them on a slide and smear them. And um, that's, that's just a very simple uh, and I think elegant way to look at uh, tissue and make a very rapid diagnosis. Um, it's kind of, you can, within minutes, um, you can arrive at a, mass, at a patient who has a mass and diagnose that mass. Um, and I've always thought, you know, that's what really drew me to it from medical school is just seeing that, how rapid it was. It went from, you know, a long list of things it could be to like, this is what it is, so. Um, and it, there's really nothing else in pathology that can beat the how rapid uh, and efficient cytology is when it, when it works well. So. so that's really connecting the dots for, you know, our listeners. I mean, for a little bit, when you were starting out your answer, I was like, man, Dr. Harley, you're really underselling cytopathology, talking about, you know, these are these you guys are just using two stains in your eyes. Stains have been around for 100 plus years. I mean, there's a lot of advancements that have been happening in medicine in general over 100 years, and you guys are still at the core. Uh, but then in the second part of your answer there, you're talking about how it sounds like you as a cytopathologist, you get that mic drop moment of, of making that that diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. And to me, it really, it's like a deep extension of, you know, the other sort of ancient things we do are just history and physical exam. And, and to me, it's like the most recent advancement in like the physical exam, uh, where you just take a few cells and you're able to, uh, you know, make a, make an important diagnosis or, or rule out things that are, you know, very worrisome that, you know, radiologists could spend all day looking at an image and, never, and, and we can look at five cells and figure out what it is oftentimes. So when it's, when, again, when it's working in its ideal, in its ideal way, so. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's wonderful. So, I mean, as a cytopathologist, as long as you can get at the cells and get some of it to you, uh, you can really help to uh, make a diagnosis. So, um, why maybe if you could help us get a little bit of an understanding about um, where are, are are there limits to cytopathology, right? I mean, if there are there certain diagnoses that I'm considering where you know I I wouldn't want to do cytology where I really need to do something like an excisional biopsy or something. Oh, absolutely, yeah. There uh, particularly uh, soft tissue neoplasms uh, often require a, a first of all a neat arrangement of tissue. Uh, uh, or immunostains or molecular tests uh, to diagnose. Some entities are defined only by, uh, you know, molecular abnormality. So obviously we can't look at that with, uh, on a stain and see what that is. Uh, but you can still see, of course, that the spindle cells are there and that, you know, they probably shouldn't be there and uh, <laughs> go on to further testing. So I uh, see. So sometimes it's not the mic drop moment, but you're help, you're providing an important step in that pathway of a patient uh, getting a diagnosis, so the physician can ultimately uh, figure out what's the best treatment. Absolutely, yeah. And often, 
in those settings, it's useful just to say, oh, you're in the lesion, uh, I'm seeing tumor. Um, so sometimes it's as simple as, as adequacy. And there's actually a, an army of cytotechnologists here, highly trained um, mid-level providers who look on site, they're in the room with the clinicians collecting the samples and, and uh, they're there and they're qualified and they're more than able to uh, assess whether adequate tissue has been taken. They're not supposed to give any particular diagnosis, although they're sometimes they're not bad at that either. But uh, so we're actually very lucky in cytopathology to have, the, like I said, like this army of very capable people who, uh, you know, mid-level providers, which other areas of medicine are taking more and more advantage of mid-level providers. Um, uh, but AP, AP, the rest of AP doesn't really do that to that extent. Mayo is actually fairly unique in that they use pathologist assistants, which also are called PAs, but they're a different type of PA than the regular PA, um, to help with the work of AP, but we're actually fairly unique in that aspect, so. Um. Yeah, I, I like the fact that you're bringing up, you know, this really, this team effort that happens and how uh, that, with that team effort, you can do things like assessing adequacy. Um, maybe you could help our audience kind of uh, understand, uh, so, Things have been, uh, you're using stains that have been around 100 years. Um, your eyes haven't been around 100 years, but they're quite sharp, I'm sure. Uh, but what are a couple, you know, are there been some advancements of cytopathology or is the practice of cytopathology exactly the same if we had gotten a time machine and went back 50 years? Yeah, you, the, some things are, are exactly the same. Um, the big advances have been kind of in the processing of cells. Um, you know, there's several machines that can make a nice, uh, there's thin prep, which is the actually the proprietary name, but it just creates a nice mono layer of cells. So if you get a bunch of cells from a fluid, you used to still be able to look at them, but they were, they were thick in some areas and it was non-uniform. Now you can put them in a nice machine and it creates a nice mono layer. So that just makes it easier. Like the, the pap smear used to be an actual smear. Uh, now they're processed with these, uh, liquid-based preparations that create a nice mono layer to be able to look. Um, and actually that has, that has changed the practice to some degree. There used to be different strategies you would employ when you would look at smears versus uh, the thin prep because the, the thin prep and other liquid-based preparations pr just evenly space all of the cells, which is nice because then you can look at them. But actually on the smears, it used to be the, the, the neoplastic or dysplastic cells used to kind of gather together. So when you found one, you would kind of really carefully track along that course um, whereas now they would all be spread out. Um, so in some ways, it actually, it it's, can be more challenging, but overall, it, it, it improves um, sensitivity and specificity in that particular aspect. Other advances, um, again, sort of ancillary, but uh, uh, you can do molecular testing directly off of the smears, and, and it turns out the, uh, the, the way that the tissues fixed on those smears is actually very delicate compared to formal infixation, and the DNA is of higher quality uh, and often of higher quantity relative to a, a, a form of fixed paraffin embedded uh, specimen. So that's very helpful when, um, you know, you, particularly in lung cancer and other cancers, which are heavily reliant on like reflex molecular testing. Um, that's obviously very useful. If, this, if the tissue is very scanty, you can just go back to the smear and uh, scrape the whole smear. I actually, I, I did a study where I scraped a bunch of the smears myself and looked at the DNA yields um, compared to tissue and it, it was superior. That had already been established, but um, I did it in a very particular context. But. So that's really interesting. Uh, so we've got a, uh, you know, a physician clinician sort of aspect of our audience. And I think to them, one of the things I'm hearing in your answers, I just want to pull out, it sounds like you're, you're playing a very active role in, um, you know, advising the clinician, right? I mean, is this something that you should do cytology for, or, or do you need to do a biopsy or, you know, based on follow-up molecular tests, you're really providing a uh, pathology consultation on what's the best strategy. Because I think clinicians sometimes feel like you know, they don't have a lot of experience with pathology necessarily. And so mm -hmm. um, they might, you know, think they need to order something, whereas, you know, maybe they don't necessarily need to. And it sounds like you're playing a role. Could you, could you either confirm or deny that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that actually functions better when uh, we do the, we ourselves do the rapid onsite um, assessment, which is uh, some, sometimes the acronym ROSE is used. Um, for rapid on-site evaluation. 
Um, so where I've seen, I've seen that work at other, Mayo is so huge and they do so many procedures at so many sites, just physically disparate. Um, you know, there's, there's 12 cytopathologists on Hilton 11, but things are happening in like a two mile radius. So there's physically no way for us to be there at the number of procedures. But anyways, when you do have that time to be there, uh, you can say, Hey, uh, send some, send some material for culture. I, I'm seeing granulomatous inflammation, or I'm, I'm just seeing a lot of polys, uh, neutrophils. Uh, collect some, a dedicated specimen for culture. Um, if you're seeing a lot of lymphoid tissue, you can say send some for flow cytometry. Um, again, Mayo actually falls outside of that paradigm as well because the heme path line is so well defined here. They they don't want any specimens coming directly from cytology, which is which is fine. Uh, but they so it's kind of interesting. We we're so sub specialized here in a way that some of that directing uh, role and and power is, is, uh, diluted, but it makes sense. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly, uh, have no problem leaving the heme cases to the hematopathologist. I can, I can say that, but there is a nice, you know, in, in the classic rapid on-site situation, you can, uh, direct specimens through a more, uh, fruitful line, um, uh, of, of inquiry based on what you're actually seeing. Uh, so. That's excellent. And then I imagine, uh, do you play a role in tumor boards across the institution as well then? Yes, um, uh, we, we actually run the, um, the thyroid tumor board, which uh, sometimes that's interesting because they they're actually more very endocrine pathology focused questions that aren't directly uh, amenable to cytology, the, the knowledge base of cytology, but uh, it's just the best fit because most thyroid nodules, in fact, almost every thyroid nodule is explored by a um, FNA. Um, and then, uh, you, you know, we may be involved with a variety of other ones. The, another classic one is- the, I'm sorry to interrupt. You say FNA, just to highlight for our audience, you're talking about a fine needle aspiration. So where the cytopathologist goes in with the needle and gets some of those cells out, exactly what you've been talking about to get a diagnosis. Uh, that's, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I think that also returns just to the the efficiency and kind of the, the how non-invasive uh, FNA fine needle aspiration is because every thyroid nodule is is explored by FNA because when you're you know when you're dealing with the neck <laughs> putting a small needle the smaller needle and not cutting tissue out to get a good answer that's obviously the ideal uh, so in, in that particular scenario it's exclusively uh, uh, cytology so you you know obviously you you wouldn't want to be doing excisional biopsies on thing if it turns out they're, they're colloid nodules, which, you know, most of them are. So uh, it's, it's a nice way to uh, stay minimally invasive and still get a high quality uh, answer. So in those sorts of areas, we tend to be the ones representing pathology at the tumor boards, even though, you know, they may on, go on to get resected and there's other pathologic considerations, but. For our student audience, uh, I was wondering if you could kind of maybe walk us through a, a difficult case that you've had, which I, I realize is probably the craziest thing a cytopathologist has ever been asked because <laughs> it's such a, a visual uh, specialty. But, um, you know, because that's some of the things that we've been talking about, students may not have necessarily been exposed to and may have a difficult time kind of following the conversation we've had. But if you could maybe take one specific case that's been challenging and kind of walk us through your thought process, how you approach the case, that might be a really interesting way for our audience to really get their arms around what is cytopathology in this interesting field that you work? Yeah, yeah. Um, so there, there, you know, there's a lot of ways that cases can be difficult. Um, I, can, I can walk through one example, but I think it's also maybe useful just to lay out all the uh, different ways cases can be difficult. So one thing is just scanty cellularity, cellularity. Like I'm just, I'm looking at eight cells and I have to decide if they're just completely benign or malignant or atypical. So the nice thing about cytology is it has a, a tier of, you know, you can say positive for malignancy, positive for neoplasm, suspicious for neoplasm or malignancy, or just atypical, which is, a you know, totally in the middle. I can't tell if it's benign. I can't tell if it's malignant. So I'm going to leave it atypical. And then of course, negative, uh, negative for malignancy. And then uh, beneath that non-diagnostic, so often, you know, the really challenging ones that I think are uh, amenable to, or it seems like you'd have to use like reading tea leaves or something, uh, you, you, you debate between non-diagnostic or atypical, because I have these like five cells, what do you do with them? I could say they're atypical, sure, but that doesn't really help anybody. 
Um, or I could call them non-diagnostic and that of course would tend to send them back for more uh, tissue. Um, so that's kind of maybe the more rote or, or sort of boring type of difficult case. Although, you know, you, you see a lot of those and uh, you know, that, that, that actually makes up the bulk of challenging cases. Um, and, you know, there are some people who really try to squeeze as much as they can out of those eight cells. Uh, and sometimes it's appropriate. Sometimes, you know, like I said, it's, it really seems more like reading tea leaves than doing actual scientific work, which there is certainly an art to pathology. And uh, some people are just very gifted at squeezing as much as possible out of a very limited sample. But, um, and then uh, other ways cases can be challenging or um, some tumors are just very rare um, and, you, and you don't see them that often. Um, um, I've, I've actually seen as just as an example, I've seen three cases of Erdheim Chester disease um, that uh, I did not diagnose on cytology. I, I called them atypical <laughs> and uh, it, it uh, required the, the help, uh, more than just the help of my hematopathology colleagues to make that diagnosis. And even they themselves say they, they almost can't believe it's a neoplasm because it's sometimes just scattered histiocytes that um, you know are, are positive for BRAF. Um, that's kind of the defining molecular alteration, but uh, so there's there are very uh, rare and also subtle uh, neoplasms that are that are particularly challenging to diagnose and uh, relying heavily on uh, my colleagues. That's one of the benefits of Mayo. Um, you can walk down a hall and find like five different world experts and <laughs> different things, and uh, so that kind of helps solve that one where you've you've got a rare. Uh, thing. And then I think another time where things become challenging is where it may not be a rare entity, but it's arising in an unusual location. And so sometimes it's more just thinking outside the box. You're like, hey, this looks like a granular, granular cell tumor. Just as a, a random example, I, uh, I sort of miscategorized one, but it was caught before the final diagnosis one time because it was in an unusual location. If you had taken it from one of the usual sites of granular cell tumor, um, like the oral cavity, the esophagus, uh, I, would have been like, I would have easily said, oh, that's just a granular cell tumor. But because it was an unusual location, it wasn't at, in the top of my mind. Um, and you know, that's in gen generically in medicine, that can be, that's just a challenge because you have your differential diagnosis built on experience and knowledge and you've got the first five things that something should be based on the site and the appearance. And, but of course, every once in a while, <laughs> someone, somebody shows up that who isn't usually there. Some that entity is there that isn't usually in that location. Um, so um, I think maybe that would, I was hoping that might be more helpful than um, uh, a specific case. Although I, I sort of ended up sharing the Erdheim Chester case where yeah. I, I just said atypical, you know, <laughs> And luckily was able to uh, route myself to the right diagnosis with, with some major help from colleagues. So. <laughs> yeah, you know, this, I, I really appreciate the way you tackled that, uh, because I think that probably in many ways is far more accessible for our listeners. And I love the fact that you're highlighting the team elements, because I think that that's one of the things that attracted me to pathology, it, that it's really a team sport. Um, I really like that you're talking about, you know, rare locations. So having to think out the side the box. I mean, that's very common to what we're exposed to in, in medical school and in medical practice, right? I mean, you understand where, how something's supposed to present, but when it uh, presents in a very unusual way, uh, there's many cases in the medical literature on, on that and, and how that can uh, be a challenge. And I think that opens up again, some of the fun of the art of thinking outside the box. So it's not just, uh, you know, recognizing uh, the cell type. Uh, there is a lot of uh, that's getting put together in your head. It's not just uh, that cell recognition. Um, and then I also like that you were kind of talking about the different uh, sort of shades of gray, if you will, for, for for how a cytopathology case may be signed out. Because um, I think that's one of the things that I try to talk with. So as a transfusion medicine physician, uh, we have uh, similar sorts of things um, for some of our diagnoses. And um, it's nice to highlight out for our external physicians that are rotating from different areas to understand how language matters uh, to the pathologist. And we're not just putting things in like a waistband diagnosis uh, for funsies. 
uh, right? It's sort of, um, you know, I, I love there's a certain honor in that of, you know, how, you know, how far can I take this? Because in your world of psychopathology, I mean, somebody may go for some excision. I mean, somebody may lose a lung because of a, of a call. And so, you know, you have to be as accurate as possible. Is that kind of how the uh, cytopathology world kind of approaches these kind of shades of gray? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, from uh, one thing I appreciated about transfusion medicine was uh, the imputability of uh, transfusion reactions, because I think often in medicine, we, you know, once we get into a certain paradigm or a certain diagnosis, we act like that's the, that's hundred percent the diagnosis. There's no doubts, but oftentimes a couple of weeks later, it's like, well, it turned out it was actually this the whole time, you know? <laughs> and so I, I, I like the, the imputed, the saying something's probable or possible, you know, indicating how certain you are. And we, and we do that in cytology. When we say positive for malignancy, we're saying we're almost completely certain. But when we say suspicious, um, depending on the organ system, we, it might only be 75% certainty. Um, there's different studies, you know, seeing where that range falls. Uh, same with atypical. Uh, we're implying that, you know, this could be malignant, but we're, we're so uncertain that we, we've backed it down. And I, I actually think other uh, elsewhere in anatomic pathology could benefit from that sort of uh, imputability or scale of how certainty, how certain we are. Um, it could be challenging to implement, and, you know, there, there are infinite degrees actually of how certain, and then there's so much individual variability, it can be hard to put in practice, but I think having a simple scale with two, three tiers uh, does it quite nicely. And actually, I think it's more intellectually honest and, uh, you know, potentially helps people keep a more open mind as, as a disease progresses that, Hey, you know, this might be something else actually. So <laughs> I think, you know uh, what, we've got a worldwide audience. And so I want to ask a question that kind of gets at some of the variation between locations. Uh, Cause you know, you've, you've trained at a couple of different places and, and, uh, and have practiced. And so um, that, cut point of what something is called is that uh you know a cut point where you're very knowledgeable about if i call this suspicious as opposed to atypical that's going to like based on my physicians here i, I understand what the next so in other words you have to understand that team of i have to understand what my surgeon is going to do if i say mm -hmm. uh this or that is that is that kind of true like there's variance across uh hospitals for what something is called, and then what does that buy the patient? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I actually, I think the thyroid is a nice uh, uh, case for this uh, particular topic. So like I said, there's everything from non-diagnostic, negative, atypical, um, uh, suspicious, and positive. Uh, atypical, uh, atypy of uncertain significance or follicular lesion of uncertain uh, significance, AUS or FLUS. Um, some institutions that that rate is about 20%, 10, 10 to 20%. At Mayo, that rate is about 1%. And um, we get calls. If we use that kind of equivocal language, we get a phone call guaranteed right away and say, hey, what, what's the deal with this thing? And uh, in the literature and the way the, the, that uh, category was developed, you're, you are meant to, or you're supposed to, or ideally use it maybe like 5% of the time, 5 to 10% of the time. Um, but here at Mayo, we, we force ourselves to either say negative or suspicious. We try to remove that kind of equivocal category. But um, other institutions I've seen, they treat those atypical very aggressively. They'll resect them and uh, a significant number of them are just uh, benign nodules with some you know, atypical features. Um, so it, it does have a very uh, different meaning at Mayo. Um, it really is a challenge. If, if we call something atypical on thyroid, it, it is something very challenging. It's a very challenging case. Whereas other places it might be uh, not for, you know, and there's different degrees of, of experience, right, too. So if you're, if you're signing out, if you only see um, a handful of thyroids a month, you know, your odds of using the atypical category are much higher. Whereas, you know, I'll, I'll see 20, 30 thyroid FNAs in a week. So my atypical category means something completely different. So, and you know, there's, that's just uh, one of the fun fundamental limitations of pathology. You can't be good at everything all the time, but the further you get out into community practice, the, you kind of are expected to be good at everything all the time. Um, but so luckily though, in those situations, you can, 
use equivocal language even whereas if you send it to mayo it might get pushed into a different category and you know ultimately that's why some patients come here is because you know they want a more uh a more definitive answer than is available elsewhere so well i love the way you did that little bit of a freudian slip there it is fundamental Fun is fundamental in pathology. So uh, we've been rounding with Dr. Chris Hartley uh, talking about cytopathology. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hartley, for joining us today. Oh, yeah. Thanks again. It's been great talking to you. And thank you for everybody uh, for joining us on this podcast. If you want to hear more on this topic, Dr. Hartley will be presenting at the Virtual Surgical Pathology Symposium, taking uh, place live via live stream October 14th through 15th, uh, 2021. Uh, to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please follow or subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations. Mm -hmm.